Hello, everybody, and welcome to Comotion Lab's Fundamentals for Startups. I'm your host, Anson Fatland, Associate Vice Provost for Innovation Strategy and Ventures uh, here at Comotion. Um, Fundamentals for Startups, as some of you know, uh, is our regular lecture series that is open to anyone who's interested in learning about entrepreneurship or building a startup. Uh, each week, we feature experts from various fields who bring you insights and inspiration uh, and give you the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, all sessions are recorded and archived on Comotion's website. For our full schedule and to register for future fundamentals, please visit bit.ly slash Comotion Fundamentals. Comotion Labs is a multi-industry incubator hosting early stage startups from both inside and outside the UW community. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we're committed to nurturing and enabling startup success through critical infrastructure, training, mentoring, and networking. And we do this without taking equity or IP. I'll say that again. We do this without taking equity or IP. We operate out of three locations on University of Washington campus here in Seattle, each with its own industry focus, life sciences and hardware incubators, which are both in Fluke Hall, and our technology incubator, which is based here in Startup Hall. If you're a founder looking for somewhere to thrive, we would love to talk with you. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to mention that for next week's event, Scott Tupper, founder and CEO of Onda Origins Coffee Roasting and Sourcing, and I have it on good source that he will be bringing samples, uh, will present A Hill of Beans, Promises and Pitfalls of Impact Startup Dogma. Today, though, Mark Sincel is here to present Start Round to End Round, Why Every Startup Must Include Sustainability in Their Business Plan. Mark is, a career Mark is a career and transition coach who typically works with seasoned technology professionals. He provides a supportive, trustworthy, and independent sounding board to accomplished individuals who have reached a fork in their professional path and need to do some out-of-the-box thinking to help them make progress towards a new set of goals. Mark is also creating a climate change coaching practice to help individuals and organizations develop sustainable and regenerative practices. Mark will take questions at the end in the live event space and, of course, via our YouTube chat. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Mark. Well, good afternoon. Are we... Uh... Looking for the slide. <laughs> okay, we're good to go. Well, welcome everyone. Sorry for the little glitch. Uh, yeah, as Anson mentioned, today's talk is about, thanks, but my, my title was Why Every Startup Should and Maybe Must Be Sustainable Right From the Start. And before, get the calendar out of here. Okay, so before I get started tell, trying to tell you why you should be sustainable, I wanted to start by saying a couple of things I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, first thing I'm not going to talk a lot about today is the science of climate change. Um, I think this audience probably knows a fair amount about the science of climate change. And even if you don't, you know enough now to get started on incorporating sustainability into your business plan. Secondly, I'm not going to get into the argument about whether humans are or not responsible for climate change. Again. You have your opinions, you've read the news, you know what you think. Um, we're just going to start wherever you are, and I'm not going to try and change anybody's mind. And then the third thing I'm not going to talk about is I'm not going to give you a recipe for being sustainable. And the reason for that is, is simple. There is no recipe right now. Um, the world around us is changing. Uh, it's a very dynamic situation. No person, no company, no government has figured out how to put out a perfect sustainable sustainability recipe. So we're not going to worry about that either. So what are we going to talk about? Well, it's lunchtime, and the clicker's not working. Uh, so let's talk about pizza. Now, why does pizza matter in all of this? Well, the story for me starts several years ago. My wife and I moved to Hawaii. And when we got to Hawaii, as you can probably guess, there were a lot of really nice things about it. One thing that wasn't so nice, however, is that they didn't have a really good pizza culture, even though they have a pizza named after them. And this was a bit of an issue for me because I really like pizza. So one of my first goals when I got to Hawaii was to learn how to make a decent pizza so I'd always have that available. 
And I found a lot of resources online. Um, you know, give a real good shout out to pizzamaking.com. Lots of good recipes for crusts, great recipes for toppings, great recipes for sauces. The one thing they couldn't really teach me how to do at the beginning was how can you make a round pizza? It's like every time I tried it, I tried to shape the dough, it would wind up some weird oblong or looking like a cartoon of an amoeba. It just it didn't work. But then eventually I stumbled across a, just a really straightforward tip that made all the difference. And that was if you want your pizza to end round, you have to start round. And then you start with a round dough ball. You gradually like shape it and at every step you keep it round. And by the time you're doing, you know, you're shaping on the counter as I would do if you're really fancy, if you're twirling it, everything just stays round. And um, so that I think is actually a really good motto for startups to keep in mind too. Because as a startup, you're making a lot of choices, you're making a lot of decisions, you're doing a lot of it fast and on the fly. But all those choices and all those decisions become incorporated into the DNA of who you are as a company. Every, it may seem small at the time, it may seem inconsequential, but once you start doing something one way, you'll keep doing it that way. And it will become incorporated into how you do things, it will become your culture, and as your company hopefully grows, becomes, becomes profitable, becomes successful, all of those decisions will matter. They will all still be there. And it is possible to go back afterwards and undo them, but it's just a lot more work to do it that way. And before I leave the slide, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Gail Jacoby. Um, you may remember she gave a talk here a couple of months ago. It was about the generative AI tool designer that they're incorporating into PowerPoint. And she was kind enough to give me access to the beta. And so all the images here are, have been generated using that AI tool, uh, except for the big blue marble we started with. That's really from NASA. So first question is, for a, for a startup, what exactly is round when you're talking about sustainability? And another shout out to a previous um, talk. Uh, Kenny Lee last week also presented this definition. Uh, I think it originated with the Brundtland Commission of the United Nations in a report called Our Common Future. They define sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Basically, don't do anything now that's going to screw things up for people down the road. Pretty straightforward. Another definition I think is a little more practical, a little more hands-on, um, was formulated by Herman Daly. He's an economist, and he was at the World Bank when he did this. And he says, sustainable development is development without growth. So that definitely gets the prize for being succinct. But we probably should unpack those terms to really understand what he meant by it. So what Daly is thinking about is he, you know, first he posits there's an economy. It's, you know, in the world, it's everything that happens, all the products and services that are produced, the economy. For that to run, it needs inputs. That would be fossil fuels, definite material inputs, labor, all the stuff that goes into making things. And after the products and services have been produced and consumed, whatever's left over is waste. Daly's insight was to put a ring on that. And he recognized that all this has to happen within the world. So he defines sustainable development as uh, development in which the inputs are taken from the world no faster than the environment in the world can regenerate those inputs. And waste is expelled out of the economy and back into the world no faster than the world can reincorporate those wastes into something useful in the world. And then, so then the second half of the definition, uh, what's development without growth? Okay, so first thought is, you can't develop without growth. That's, they're the same thing. For Daly, they weren't quite the same thing. Um, so his view of it was you, what the economy is doing is it has this sort of material throughput going through, from the inputs through the economy to the wastes. And he viewed growth as an increase in those material throughputs. So if you're consuming more materials to produce what you're doing, you're growing. He distinguished that from development by saying that development is the increase in the utility of what the economy is producing. So if the economy is producing more stuff and more useful services, products, and, and it's more useful to us, that's 
that's, that's development. And development without growth is actually much, you know, is probably very familiar to you even if you haven't thought of it this way. One way to think of it is um, to think about this meeting. So we are, the utility of this meeting is I'm presenting something to you. Hopefully you'll find it interesting. Um, but you're all in the room. Well, we can grow that audience using Zoom. So all the people who are out there on Zoom are able to see this without having to put in all the you know, physical materials that it requires to get into the room. So Zoom is a way of developing, increasing utility without necessarily growing the material throughput. Another good example of this, um, we recently concluded the uh, global festival for the Climate Coaching Alliance. There was a main festival with nine keynote speakers and then several other speakers supporting them. And after that concluded, we had a fringe festival that had 45 more speakers. And there were more than 1,000 participants from every country, uh, well, all right, every continent at least. I'm not sure if it's every country. But all around the world, all able to participate. And what made this sort of an example of development without growth is what you don't see on the banner advertising this. There is no location for this. All of this took place online. None of it happened at any place. And what that means is that those 1,000 plus people were able to get all the utility out of that conference and having participated in it was very, very worthwhile without having to buy a plane ticket, without having to travel, without having to get a hotel room. So all of the you know, carbon emissions and products associated with that were avoided simply by using a different format. Okay, so now we're thinking about um, the being more sustainable as a company. So if you wanted to get to being sustainable, some things to think about, uh, first of all, is that this is not all about you. Um, certainly, your company is going to have direct impacts, but you're embedded in a value chain. There are people upstream from you that are supplying things to you. There are people downstream from you that are using those things. They're all generating emissions. They're all generating greenhouse gases. And you can't control them, but you're very much associated with them and you're interdependent with them. And the usual framework for talking about this is what are called scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. And, those, and a good way to remember these is that scope one is what you burn in producing whatever you're producing. Scope two is what you, the energy that you buy, so the greenhouse gas emissions that are created by what you buy, energy. And scope three is everything beyond that. So that's everything upstream of you or downstream of you in the value chain. To illustrate that, um, let's use a couple of examples. We'll use a fossil fuel producer and a delivery service. So this might be an Exxon, a Chevron, a BP for the producer, and maybe a UPS, a FedEx, an Amazon for the delivery service. So for the fossil fuel producer, the scope one emissions, what they burn, is pretty much whatever energy they have to burn to run their, run their oil there to get the oil out of the ground. And you know, typically, compared to the amount of oil they take out of the ground, it's probably fairly small. Similarly, the energy that they have to buy to run them, maybe electricity to run their facilities, probably fairly modest again. But when we move to scope three, that's when the fossil fuel producers really start to have an impact because all of their energy, or all their fuel, is first going to refineries, and when that oil is refined, you're generating a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. After the, those, the products of the refinery are sent downstream, they may go to an electricity producer. They're gonna likely generate greenhouse gas emissions as they burn those products to generate electricity. And when they, the oil or the gas that's produced at the refinery is put into trucks, into delivery trucks, and used to deliver things around the world, Again, more greenhouse gas emission. That's not directly coming from the fossil fuel producer, but it is part of their scope three emissions. It's part of their beyond. Now let's look at the other side. Look at the, the delivery service. And just to make it simple, we'll only talk about two parts of the service. We'll talk about the cloud servers that take in the orders, that coordinate things, and that get every, the dispatch information out to the delivery service. And then we talk about the trucks that deliver things. So their scope one emissions, what they burn, that's pretty much the trucks. 
and what all the gas that they burn, all the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, those are coming out of the trucks. The cloud servers, probably not so much. Um, yeah, you don't usually fire up a diesel generator to run a cloud server. Now, the emissions from the things they buy, that becomes a little more significant. Um, again, the producing the gas that goes into the trucks at the refineries, that creates emission. If you're running your cloud servers on electricity that's produced by a, um, an electricity generator that is using inputs from a refinery, that's generating more emission. So their buy can be fairly high, the scope two. And then when we look beyond that, um, further upstream, you have anything related to the extraction of the oil from the ground. And also you may have things like producing packaging. A lot of energy goes into producing packaging and the delivery service consumes a lot of packaging. So that would go into their, more into their scope three. Um, as I thought about it, that may fall into scope two, but you know, whatever. It's something that they don't, aren't directly controlling. And the specifics of this aren't super important, but what is important is to recognize that as a startup, um, you're very interdependent with a lot of other organizations and a lot of other places where emissions can happen and where environmental damage can occur. And you're not directly res entirely responsible for it, but the reporting requirements that are coming into force now make you at least accountable to, for that. And you will have to know what those things, what your scope one, two, and three emissions are, and you will have to report them. Another thing to keep in mind is it's not all about carbon. And obviously carbon gets a lot of the headlines, climate change gets a lot of the headlines, but sustainable development is about a lot more than just making sure you don't emit any carbon. A good framework for this is, are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Again, this is a, so I think Kenny also put up this slide. And it's an interesting slide because you, obviously you see the, the usual suspects on there. You see uh, 13 climate action, you know, affordable and uh, clean energy and it, industry innovation, those sorts of things. But there's a lot on here that doesn't immediately come to mind when most people think of sustainability. We have you know, no poverty, zero hunger, peace, justice, and strong institutions, uh, reduced inequalities, gender equality, life below water, life above. Um, you know, a lot of things that are definitely not directly related to carbon, but these are all interrelated. And so as you think about where you might have impact as a startup, climate and you know, carbon emission and greenhouse gas emission is useful to think about, but there's a lot of other things to think about too, where you might be able to have more direct impact depending on what your startup does. And it's also useful to note what the UN has identified as the single most important sustainable development goal. And that's reduced inequalities. And since we're you know, kind of constrained on time, I'm not gonna go into all the reasons that they identify this as the most important one, but it is worth looking into. And it also is something to think about as you begin to develop your company. Um, because every company has a pay structure. And you're probably very familiar with studies about you know, the relative pay of a CEO versus the lowest paid worker in the company. And I'm not really tall enough to give you a sense of what that difference really is, but it's big. And as you start to form your company, an easy way to address reducing inequalities is make that smaller. Just something to think about. Okay, so as a startup, we all know you have very limited money, you have very limited time, and you have a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff to do. So why should you bother with sustainability now? Who really cares? And the first answer to that question that I'll give you is that probably a lot more people care about it than you think. There was a recent uh, study published in Nature. I think it was a group of sociologists and they did a survey of Americans across all demographic groups, all political persuasions, all geographies. And they asked them a set of questions that were all designed to assess really one basic question. And that was the question of whether Americans support or oppose climate-friendly policies. 
And the specific question that they asked was, do you believe that other people support or oppose climate-friendly policies? And what they found is that Americans think that others believe that opponents of climate-friendly policies outnumber the supporters by two to one. So in a democracy, that's really bad news for climate policy. There's no way you win if you out want to outnumber two to one. But there's a catch, as there always is with studies like this. And the catch is, is that when they asked this question, they already knew what the answer was, because the Yale Program for Climate Change Communication had already done a study asking the same set of questions with a slight twist in it. What the Yale program asked was, they went to all these, the same, same distribution of people and said, do you support climate friendly policies or do you oppose them? And what they found is that supporters of climate friendly policies outnumber the opponents by two to one. Exactly the opposite of what people believe. And so the researchers in this uh, referred to Americans as living in a false social reality. We believe that the rest of the people in our country don't support climate friendly policies, when in reality they all, do, not all, but they largely do. And as a former astrophysicist, this is one of these things that gets my spidey sense tingling because I'm like, that looks like a very unstable equilibrium. You may think of it as a tipping point in making. So there's a good chance that attitudes towards it are going to shift very quickly and very soon. Who else cares? Well, right at the top is customers care. And as a startup, you're all about getting customers. There is a lot of market research out there now that's showing that customers have, there's a lot more demand for products that are produced and services that are provided by companies that have a strong and authentic commitment to sustainable practices. They've also found that customers are much more loyal to brands that have that commitment. And as an organization, having a real commitment in that direction allows you to present, pro project a much more positive brand image. Who else cares? Well, employees also care. And as startups, again, you're probably not in the stage of hiring a lot of employees right now. But when you do, you're going to, be want, you're going to want to get the best employees you can get. And employees now care a lot. Well, they care about a paycheck but they care a lot about going to work at a place where they can find meaning in what they do, where it can matter what they're doing, where it has an impact on the world. And companies have found that it is a lot easier to recruit employees if you have, a, again, a very sincere and a very authentic and true sustainable policy in place. And then once you have those employees, they found that employees in those companies are more engaged, they have higher levels of intrinsic motivation, they're more committed to their work, they're more productive, they're more creative, and they're more innovative. Basically, they're the people you want to hire. So by having the sustainability policy out there, you're putting up a sort of bat signal saying, look, this is the place you want to come and work. Who else cares? So governments also care. And you don't need to look any further than the Inflation Reduction Act to get a sense of how the US government is, feels about it at the moment under the current administration. Uh, there is about $370 billion in there in direct payments and incentives um, that are all directed towards sustainable development, which sounds like 370 billion good reasons to think about sustainability. Um, other governments are also paying attention. The EU has just announced very stringent new guidelines for reporting on sustainability and you may think, well, we're just starting up in the US, so that doesn't matter. But those things, one, they tend to percolate. Once they take hold in one country, they're gonna to move to other countries. Secondly, remember your value chain. If you have any customers in the EU, or if you work with any suppliers or collaborators in the EU, they are going to have to verify that you are meeting the standards that they are gonna to have to report to their governments. Who else cares? Well, investors care. Gartner did some research recently and they found that 85% of investors consider the, the categorized as the environmental, social, and governance, the ESG policies of the companies they're thinking of investing in. 
Now, why should investors care about whether you have a good ESG policy? It's not out of the goodness of their heart. It's because it reduces their risk. They have lower investment risk if they have a company that has a strong ESG policy. Now, there are you know, several things up here that contribute to that. But what they found is that the real point here and the strategic value of a sustainability policy wasn't so much in the specifics. It was that if you have that policy, you're almost required to maintain constant communication with the key stakeholders around your company. You have to learn from them, and you have to adapt to what they're telling you. And so in a dynamic situation, companies that have the sustainability policy that are engaged with it, they hear the signals coming sooner. They know when there's going to be economic changes. They know when there are going to be environmental changes. They're more aware when there's social changes, and they're definitely more aware of regulatory changes coming down the line. So they're better able to adapt to these things and to move forward when those changes occur. That's what the main thing that reduces the risk, and that's why investors like companies that are paying attention to this. So hopefully, you know, that gives you a, a sense of why one should do that. But then once we think about that, it's like, well, how am I going to get started? Again, limited time, limited money, all the constraints on you as a startup. How does one begin getting a handle on this? Well, it may sound counterintuitive, but the best way to start is to step back from your company entirely. And just think about yourself and ask yourself some questions. First off, what kind of world do you want to live in? Because that's really what this is all about. Sustainability isn't about hitting some target number of carbon in the atmosphere. It's about living in the world that you want to be in, and that your kids want to be in, and your neighbors and your friends want to be in. So as you're thinking about it, a way to approach it is to be very sensory about it. Think, how does it, that world sound? How does it smell? What does it look like? What does it feel like to be in it? Um, you know, experiment with different words that seem to match up. Do you want that world to be concrete? Do you want it to be verdant? Do you want it to be competitive? Do you want it to be noisy? Do you want it to be tranquil? Do you want it to be generous? And as an example of how useful this can be, um, I worked with a client once, and he was considering what his next move in his life was going to be. And he was thinking about where he wanted to live. And it, he'd always wanted to live near the water. And they said, well, oh, so do you want to be, um, you know, do you want to be like smelling you know, salt water? Do you want to hear the rolling thunder of waves? And he's like, no, no, that's not what I want at all. I want to smell like pine, and I want it to have like the sound of moving water. Yeah, that's, it became very clear to him. And then as he thought about it more, he's like, oh, and you know, I really would like it to be in a small group of houses. And so this image of the small group of houses in a community in the pines near a river became very clear to him. He's like, that's what I want to do. And this is important because it really affects the decisions that he makes down the line. Because with that image in mind, he wasn't likely to take jobs that were in the city center, near the city where he lived. It was, had to be different sorts of jobs. And that brings us to another question, which is related to that. Like, how would your organization behave in that world that you're living in? And that can be either you know, how, does, how do the people within the organization work with each other, or how do those people behave to the rest of the world around them? And throwing out some words can, again, be a useful way to explore that question. Um, you want that to be a transactional kind of life? Is it um, you, know, you give me X and I give you Y in return and we all go happy? Uh, do you want it to be more collaborative, more hierarchical, creative, nurturing, philanthropic? You know, kind of throw out these ideas of what are possible. Do you want your company to grow at all costs, or do you want it to be part of a regenerative structure? And what, how might that change your mindset when you take these different images? And as an example of that, I had a client who was, um, she was shifting from being a very, uh, very, very accomplished individual contributor, um, but her goal was to be more of a consultative, helping kind of role. And when she thought about her mindset as an individual contributor, it was the word that came up was mercenary. It's like, you know, you get the project in, you grind, 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 you make that project perfect, and then you get it back and you get paid. Boom. And she was great at that. But when you're in a consulting and helping role, that doesn't work anymore. You've got to be much more generous. You've got to be more collaborative. You've got to be more patient. 
You've got to allow the person or the people that you're working with to bring something to it. So she really had to shift her mindset in how she dealt with people out in the outside world. Another question. What's your organization's stake in this vision? And that kind of comes down to why now? And for a startup, that's important. Why do this now? Why not do it later? And a lot of people, when they look at this question, this is when the kind of dark parts of climate change come out. It's like, what if you don't do anything? If I don't do anything, is you know, the temperature going to go up? More extreme weather. We're going to have more flooding. You know, just the craziness going to happen is, I mean, if you want to go all the way to the dark side, you say, you know, is society going to collapse? And there are some people that actually, they think that. I'm not one of them, but it's a, it's a vision. But that dark side is also a good motivation for a different side of it. You can start to think, well, but what if I do do something? Maybe I can avoid some of those things. Maybe I can adapt to them. Maybe life can still be quite good if I engage with this right now. And an example of this one, um, I was working with a guy. He was a fundraiser for a nonprofit in, um, in the Southeast. And he was a really great fundraiser, really enjoyed it, meaningful nonprofit. But it's not what he wanted to be anymore. He wanted to be an organic farmer. So this question of why now became very, very critical. Because if you know anything about developing an organic farm, that all has to be certified. And I believe the, a lot of the farmland that this guy was looking at was conventionally farmed, so it had to be, you had to go through that transition process, which is a multi-year process. So in order to get to where he wanted to go, it was going to take many years. Every year that he continued to do fundraising and didn't embrace that idea of being an organic farmer was a year of that that's lost. Oop. And... Last question for this one is, ask yourself where, as you start to focus on this, where can your organization have the most impact? And when I think about this, I like to use that, the hammer and nail metaphor that I'm sure all of you have heard. And it's, people will tell you if you're not being creative enough, they'll say, well, if, you, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And it's like, oh, well, you should pay attention to nuts and bolts and all these other things. But as a startup, you're going to be very focused on one particular kind of customer. You're providing one particular kind of product. In a very real way, you are a, you are a hammer. And that's what you want to be. Because that allows you to ignore all the nuts and bolts, all the irrelevant stuff, and go out and find those nails that need to be pounded and pound those nails. That's what you're there for. And for an example of this one, Another client, uh, she was a senior R&D person at a major tech firm down in California. And she had been responsible for very, very large infrastructure projects, doing all the hardware and the software, coordinating all the efforts of many, many people, and had been very, very successful, but had sort of hit the end of what she was going to do with that. And was far too young to retire, and really no interest in retiring. But she had a really strong commitment to healthcare. She really wanted to be involved in healthcare, but she wasn't a doctor. So one option is, oh, go back to med school, spend 10 years, you know, do your residency, do all that stuff. Again, that just wasn't even on the table. So the strategy that she took was, well, wait, I still know how to bring home these really big infrastructure projects. I know how to coordinate the hardware and the software, get all this thing working. She found a way take that expertise and partner with people who already have the healthcare expertise. And so she found her hammer, you know, that infrastructure expertise, and found a place to, where there was a nail that needed to be pounded. And it matched up with her values, so it was a very good fit. So before I leave the slide, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Charlie Cox and Sarah Flynn. Uh, their book, Climate Change Coaching, is the source of some of these questions and definitely the inspiration for all of them. So the last big question is, can you do this? Can you actually have an impact on the world like that? And the answer is yes. And this is Frere. We have David Glenn right here. He's one of the, the members of Frere. And they combined a love and passion of aviation with a recognition that um, 
farmers over fertilize like crazy. They basically use twice as much fertilizer as they need to. And that fertilizer, it just runs off into the, um, into the waterways. And so that has two major sustainability problems. One is fertilizer is extremely energy intensive to produce. Um, and so it results in huge amounts of emissions. If you can cut those by half right out of the gate, that's a huge benefit. Plus all that fertilizer runoff runs into the ocean, generates algae blooms, it's very damaging to the environment. So they were able to put that this sort of hammer and nail together in this case, and it turned out well. They just recently won, I don't know if you can see all the details, but they recently won the Alaska Airlines Environmental Innovation Challenge. They got the grand prize. So by putting those things together and seeing where they could have their impact, and I'm not even sure if you guys consciously had that sort of sustainable development goal in mind, but by focusing on that kind of problem, they had an incredible, they've already had an incredible impact. And I think we'll still have more in the future. So the last thing I want to leave you with is um, some more resources. Um, a really good one for startups is this um, site, Aim to Flourish. And I'm going to have to read this all off so because it's a long name. But it, it's put out by the Fowler Center for Business as an agent of world benefit at the Weatherford School of Management at Case Western Reserve University. And basically what this is is a compilation of thousands, literally thousands of case studies of different companies who have incorporated different elements of the sustainable development goals into their business plans. And it talks about kind of how they did it, you know, what they did, how they learned about what they were going to do, uh, and then how did it turn out. And you know, spoiler alert, the ones on this, they generally turned out good. Um, but, there, but the case studies cover all different um, industries, all different kinds of products, um, and they're worldwide. So you're almost certain to find at least a few that match up at least somewhat with the kind of work that you're doing. And so with that, um, yeah, oh, and I also point out, um, if you ever want to get in touch, you can reach me on my email or my website. Um, I'm always happy to talk about this. Um, and with that, I will open up the floor to questions. I was curious about the website you just mentioned. Is that something where uh, the individuals submit their story, or do other people, is it curated? Do other people write their business story for them? I'm just curious. Yeah, this is usually business students um, in sustainable development programs or in environmental programs who go out and interview. Um, they, they find the businesses, they go out and they interview them, and then they write up the case study under the supervision of their professors. Quick question on, uh, is there been a study on big businesses, sustainability, when it comes to the uh, first uh, slide that you showed when it comes to poverty, inequality, when it comes to a big business tackling all of those into their business design? I can say with some certainty there's no big business that's incorporated all of them into it. Um, and I think the most recent thing I've heard is I was um, talking with a, a fellow coach who's in the UK who does a lot of work with larger organizations. And what he's finding, and so hopefully this will be germane to your question, but what he's finding is that a lot of businesses have set a lot of goals. There's a lot of paperwork out there. Um, but they're finding that they're running, and, and not through any fault of their own, but they're, just, they're running into a sort of ceiling in what they're able to actually get themselves to do. Um, then this is sort of, I think that where the larger businesses are at is they're, they're kind of stuck at that, a point of, they know what they want to do, they like to go in a certain direction, but it's just, and this kind of, this goes to the question of starting round and end round, is that their business is so, in, um, how to say it, it's so committed to one way of doing things that it's just really hard to shift to a different way of doing things. Hey, um, <clears throat> When you were talking about uh, the income inequality from a CEO to the lowest paid person, uh, do you have any like proposal on like how to how to get some motivation for a CEO to 
like actually bridge that gap because obviously they're going to be very motivated to pay themselves like why why change that and not pay themselves but you know yeah i don't think you're likely to get it coming directly from a ceo um i think that it's more um i it, my instinct is to say that it's as a sort of cultural norm shift if people look at ceos and say that's just not appropriate um, that that is probably how it will change because I know in certain in other countries that's not necessarily the case um, but you I think your, your point is very well taken that it's it's really hard to change that because that our, our system is designed in a way that produces that and it's not that easy to undo Uh, another question kind of on what he was covering for the startups then what kind of we're here for um, how is it best to uh, balance the sustainability versus the greed because the greed comes in when you got the investors that want the profit and you want to try and get your company to get that balance I don't think you can say there's a best way to do that. I think that's where the exploring the values of the people in the startup right from the beginning is crucial. Um, because I'm not arguing by any means that you should not profit from what you're doing. And nor do I think that reducing inequalities means that you have to make everybody exactly the same. I don't think that's either realistic or really even desirable. Um, so yeah, my answer would be that I think it really comes down to make sure that your values are clear. Um, and if your startup values making as much money as possible as fast as you can, you know, that's what you're likely to do. You know, but if your values are more, um, we want to have, like, have a lower level of inequality, more equality within our company, um, then you'll make different decisions about how you, you know, like how your pay structure is, is set up. Um, I think one thing along those lines that I think is really an interesting question that I don't have an answer to um, has to do with the stock, is that a lot of the profit and a lot of the money that comes out of startups, particularly if you're working with VC, comes out of the appreciation of the value of the shares. And that one, I think, is a much more challenging question of how do you kind of moderate that. If you look at you know, many of the CEOs of tech companies, they may say, well, I have a salary of a, a dollar a year, you know, which is fine when your stock appreciated by $100 million that year. So that, that I think is something that I don't have an answer for, but I think that startups should really think about. I have a question from YouTube. What are some of the common mistakes startups make when trying to be more sustainable? Common mistakes. I'm not sure that you really, that the startups really make that many mistakes trying to be sustainable. Um, I think that it's so hard to, to, to find the time and the money to do it at all, that anything that you try is, is worth trying. Um, and this kind of goes back to the very beginning when I said there are no recipes for this. There are, the, I think the best way to, the framework that I like to use when I'm talking to people about climate is take a model of test, learn, adapt. You know, try anything. If you think it might work, try it out. You know, don't commit your whole company to it, but try it, and then see how it works. If it works well, then learn from that and be like, okay, I want to do more of that. If it doesn't work, it doesn't have the impact you're looking for, try something different. So that's the adapt part. So I think that, um, Dad, don't worry about making mistakes. Try things, see how they work. Hi, Mark. Um, I was wondering if you could give your thoughts as I'm listening to you talk about, like, you know, just go out there and try things. Um, I'm, I hear this term uh, greenwashing uttered a lot. And I was wondering, um, you know, as a startup, you know, as a founder uh, eager to try and incorporate sustainability, uh, do you have any like general rules of thumb or advice where we can try and avoid or, you know, things that you've seen in your experience that might be considered that or or if that's terms just BS or I'd like to see what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, don't greenwash. <laughs> um, 
And for those of you who don't know, greenwashing is you know, portraying yourself as being very sustainable and very concerned about the environment, while in reality doing the opposite. Um, and I think that's very easy to avoid. I mean, if you know, you know if you're greenwashing. And, um, and assume that your customers are smart enough to know too. And, just, and if you assume that your customers are smart enough to see when you're greenwashing, you'll be fine. YouTube. Can you talk about the challenges faced by any specific industries trying to embrace a circular ec um, economy model? For example, textiles, manufacturing, and how they have overcome these challenges. Uh, well, textiles, yes, is a fantastic example. And the short answer is that they haven't. I mean, they're... Um, and again, this goes back to that question of what, being a recipe. Nobody's cracked the code for how to do this. And you can't just say, oh, well, don't buy any clothes, don't wear clothes anymore. That's not going to work. You know, um, I think there are, a lot of, there are a lot of companies that are beginning to think about how you, you know, become more circular with, with things like textiles. Um, but it's, not, it's just not easy to do. It's not easy to see how do, you, like, how do I take this shirt and when I'm done with it, turn it into something that's useful. It's, you know, it wasn't made to, to do that with. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that answers the question, but that is where we're at. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for your talk, Mark. I appreciate it. I have a question. You had mentioned um, one of the, you've been like a list of people that care, and one of them you said that customers care about this. Customers care about when companies have sustainability sort of built into what they're doing. And, um, I guess the question I have on that is, you know, do you have any sense of, of how, what percentage of customers that care actually make decisions based on their caring? So, like for example, I, I care if a company, you know, is sustainable or, you know, has good business practices, but at some point, uh, you know, I, I might go with something that's a little bit cheaper or that's right in front of me instead of me having to wait three days for it. So, it's one thing to say that customers care, it's another thing, for, another thing to say that they act on those beliefs. Do you, do you have a sense of kind of where that lies in terms of what customers do? And what, versus what they just care about versus and not doing. That uh, makes well, sense. Let me uh, let me ask you then. In reality, no, um, this is a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Then um, my my answer is that I think people do, but I don't think it's the only consideration any customer has. I think that things like price and convenience are factors, um, and I don't think that as a startup that should be ignored. But if you can present a package where you're like, I'm giving you. Fair, typically, things that are green are not very much more expensive. And as um, the cost of renewable energy and the cost of, um, as, as, things, as green approaches are incorporated into the value chain, they actually tend to reduce the costs of production as they begin to scale up. Initially, it's a little more expensive, but eventually they do, they're either competitive or lower. And so I think as a startup, if you can present a package where you've got competitive price, you are as, at least as convenient as the other one, and you're on the, say, on the same shelves or in the same Amazon page as your competitors, and you have an authentic sustainability um, position, then you've got it all. And I think that's what you should look for, because you're, you're, you're completely right that if things are a lot cheaper or if they're a lot more convenient, for most of us, it's not going to matter. We're going to go with the cheaper, convenient thing. Uh, oh. oh, I think he was first, sorry. <laughs> so my question is, early on you talked about uh, how uh, governance has, has to have you document your sustainability. Um, do startups have any kind of starter kit for knowing who to contact and getting the right forms and all that? Or is it something that you have to uh, dig into once you're at a certain uh, size or income or whatever? Let's see, right now I think um, there, is in the there isn't a general one. Um, 
Like as Kenny mentioned last week, if there's if you're trying to get certified as a B Corp, then there is a, a lot of support for startups for kind of showing them what they need to do to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, but in general, no. And um, but as you're saying it, I'm like that would be a very useful thing to have um, to uh, to kind of go through. Because I think in the U.S., there's not the reporting requirements if it's a general company are not very stringent. They're and I think they may even be entirely voluntary. So it's not a pressing issue. But um, but I actually like that idea of putting together something like that. Kind of curious about your opinion on um, kind of mandatory reporting in that sense. Like one of the things you have up here is a data alliance. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like how businesses are required to have ADA compliant websites, but startups don't necessarily necessarily implement it every time. I'm curious whether or not. Uh, some kind of ma mandatory regulation might help the situation. I think it would be useful to have a standardized reporting requirement. Uh, because I think, and this goes to David's question about greenwashing, um, you can really, you can report, you can selectively report things about your company in a way that makes you look far more green than you really are. And that seems to me to be a natural response. You don't want to go out there talking about how bad you are. You want to talk about what you're good at. Um, and I think the standardized reporting requirements that everybody's required to participate in would alleviate some of that. Because then you're not asking companies to step out there on their own and say, OK, yeah, I'm doing this well, but no, I'm doing terrible at this. Um, if everybody has to do it, it's not quite as painful. Um, I've heard the the three hundred and seventy billion dollars towards sustainable uh, funding kind of mentioned a couple times now. Do you have any sense of how startups can begin to start applying for that and like where they go and what what uh, milestones they might need to reach to be able to access it? Uh, in terms of specifics, I don't, but I have seen there are a lot of sites starting to spring up that give people information about how to get access to that money. Um, I honestly think that it was surprising to a lot of people in the community how generous that part of that, those provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act were. Uh, because the conversation I've been hearing in the, the green community is, oh, how do we, how do, is, is your question, how do we get that money? And um, so my advice would be go out and, and look for um, people that are starting to kind of open up the pathways to that. Because I don't think it's been formalized yet. I have a question from YouTube. What would you say to companies now faced with a primarily remote staff who may have previously considered incorporating sustainability in construction in consideration of their employees' health, often known to be part of the triple bottom line, and are now pulling back on these practices in an effort to save costs? I'm not quite sure I understand what the question is. Um, is it, are they considering reinstating the working um. Um, sorry that's what was written so. okay oh, well, um, okay well I can I think that remote work is a great opportunity to reduce a lot of the you know, impact of working on the climate because you're not commuting uh, I think there there's a lot of drawbacks though because being confined to your home and having your entire work and personal life in your home can be difficult, and there's a lot of value to uh, being in the office. So in terms of, like, consider, I think that you have to balance those considerations. Um, and, but I would, I guess, again, I'm not quite sure what the, the question I was trying to get at, but I don't think I would reject the possibility of having an office just because you were going to save all the gas that people were using to get there, because um, again, when it comes to sustainability, it's important not to get focused on a number. You don't be like, I just have to get my emissions down to this and everything will be fine. 
it's all about how do you want to live in the world and then how do you make that work with the constraints that are in the world. So unless we have more questions, I have a standard question mark, which I'm sure you've heard me ask at other talks. What books should we follow up with to learn more about this? Or what book are you reading that has nothing to do with this that you'd like to share with us? <laughs> you know, um, I was thinking about that. And I'm going to throw out a book that I read because, just out of personal interest, but turned out to have a lot to say about how to think about living in the world that beyond economics. And it's Adam Smith's other book. It's not The Wealth of Nations. It's The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And it's, when I first looked at it, I thought, I'm going to hate this book. It's just like written in this old English style, blah, blah, it's terrible. But he has this really, really engaging style. He has lots and lots of great stories in it. And he's very, very um, insightful about what it means as a person to try to live in a society and be the best person that you can be in that society and why it is that it's worthwhile to do that. And I felt, and I felt there were several passages in that book where I thought, wow, this is, he's not talking about sustainability, but he's very much talking about the mindset that is valuable if you want to live in a sustainable world. All right, um, I want to thank everybody who joined us online and I want to thank everybody in the room and I would like you to join me in thanking Mark for his time and the presentation today. And then as a reminder, the series continues next week uh, at noon. We'll be hearing from Scott Tupper, whose topic is A Hill of Beans, Promises and Pitfalls of Impact Startup Dogma. Uh, please sign up for that. Everybody enjoy your weekend, and hopefully we will see you next Friday. Thanks, Mark. <laughs>